As we speak, perhaps in the next 10 or 15 minutes, there's going to be a child in Ghana who would be getting the first shot of the malaria vaccine. It's been a very, very cumbersome and a tiring moment for everyone who studied malaria and the protozoa to come to this point when you have an effective vaccine. And it's finally going to be administered in the next 10 or 12 minutes. There are 260 new vaccines waiting in the wings, uh, you know, 101 for cancer, 137 for infectious diseases, 10 for allergies, 4 for Alzheimer's, and 8 for autoimmune diseases, which are near ready in terms of proof of concept has been cleared. They're now looking at the feasibility, whether it can be administered to humans and whether it's going to be successful in terms of its, uh, its immunological response. You know, this is different. Vaccines are different. Drug interventions are different from actually building a spacecraft or a motor car or a railroad system. Where you build bottom up and you get your engineering knowledge and you do what you want to do. Here you're dealing with something which is very interesting, which is hundreds of millions of years of evolution, right? So we must keep in mind to understand anything in life around us. We must understand that we all come all of us as humans share a common origin with all life on this earth and we are connected with all life on this earth through the thread of a shared chemistry and the thread which connects this is DNA. So by understanding any organism, you can understand any other organism. That's one point to keep in mind. So where all this comes from is very important and how we get infected, how we, you know, diseases are self-limiting or advanced, all of that is because of evolution and what we can learn from that. So at the heart, fundamental biology and understanding it is a very exciting area. And what is even area and what is even more exciting is that the tools to do biology, the digital tools, the technological tools have been completely transformative over the last decade or so. So biology can be accessed by people at the highest end in India, which was not the case 10 or 15 years ago. So this is a very exciting area. That combined with the digital and artificial intelligence advances which you've heard about, allows vaccines to be looked at in multiple ways and much more rapidly developed than what it was earlier. The tuberculosis or malaria vaccines under development or just being rolled out took literally decades. So can we go in years rather than decades now? And it looks like that's feasible. Now I'll end by you know, pointing out two kinds of purposes of vaccines. One is from a public health perspective, right? What vaccines should we have? Smallpox, you know, chikungunya, dengue, COVID, and so on and so forth. These are diseases which infect a large number of people, and there's a public health value in developing vaccines. Then there's the other one, vaccines for specific autoimmune diseases, for very specific cancers, for very specific kinds of mental health disorders. Vaccines are becoming feasible for those. Those are not big public health issues, but they're very expensive to develop. How do we balance these two in a system like ours, which is geared towards public health investment and you know, has to deal with that, while also meeting the requirements of a small number of individuals in each case, which in a large population like India adds up to a very large number of people. That is a very important challenge. So can we make inexpensive or frugal vaccines for very complex diseases which affect a smaller number of people and have high-end vaccines for the public health ones? The answer is yes. For that, we have to break the patent and uh, IP regime of all the big companies all over the world. That requires young people like you to be innovative and break through. And that base in India is present. As long as we recognize that the way to go forward, whether it is public health or it is specific disease control, is vaccines. The moment governments and people recognize that, the next question is who funds it and how. Now funding it not so easy. 
people have been taking the easier route of getting cheaper vaccines into the UIP, the universal immunization process, and saying that we have done it. That's not it. Nobody is really coming forward to create a fund to, let's say, do the R&D that is required to get to new vaccines. Globally, we created a structure called Gavi. That was basically for vaccines to be reached. Gavi as a structure is a delivery mechanism where they are delivering vaccines to people in remote corners of the globe. It is not really a vaccine encouraging mechanism. Now, one of the reasons for that is that that is very resource intensive. And resources will have to come as long as, now let me put this way, as long as people stake their claim that if a vaccine can save life, we must have it. That is at the core of thing. For unfortunately, majority do not associate morbidity with vaccines. So, morbidity for them is a treatment regimen where they get all right. But if you have it at the back of the mind that I can prevent this morbidity from happening, that is where the strength will come from. Somebody somewhere needs to create a platform for private finance to come together. There are lots of private finance in the market today doing micro level work with little impact. But if you pool those micro resources, you can have a major impact through a vaccine. And the future, let me tell you, of health is lies in vaccines. We will have to do it. Now, Indian startups in the COVID period did something amazing which they hadn't done earlier. India was known as a vaccine developer for the world or vaccines which had been, you know, brought past regulation elsewhere in the world. And two of three vaccines in the United Nations Child Immunization Program were made in India. So India had a huge volume, but a low market value overall. That has started to change because there's much more daring now in Indian startups and Indian companies, big and small, to develop new vaccines on their own that had been started a little earlier, but that courage is there. So the courage to use the diagnostics and to make vaccines is now there. Now, they, now we come to the last and most fundamental problem. If I as a company, big or small, make a vaccine and take it through all the regulatory hoops in a situation where the disease outbreak is not there or very modest, how do I make a profit? How do I sustain myself? And that is an enormous challenge. So two quick points here, what needs to be done. Number one, I need to have something which brings bread and butter to the table. So I develop, you know, vaccines which are available like I'm already doing and make sure that that brings money to the company. I can sustain myself. Now the other vaccines I need to be able to develop and the regulator should be flexible that I take it past phase one or phase two and be ready at pole position. And therefore I need some resources for that holding operation to take through. That combined with the frugal development cost, that needs to be subsidized as opposed to subsidizing the whole thing. And this needs to be something which India can, should, and I think will start taking the lead because this is something which is not going to happen by Western agencies taking a lead for the whole world. Some of that is happening, a lot of that is good, but India needs to take a lead. Just as with defense, whatever it is, our development of our own defense tools is critically important. While we might import something, same is true for health. Every death which can, which is vaccine preventable, must be prevented. It's right. And that is the basic ground on which the universal immunization program in India began. And the basket kept expanding and the two of us sat and did the last five new vaccines in India. Now, having said that, there are two things the government needs to do to sustain it. One is continue to support universal vaccination program so that any vaccine produced continues to find a market. So the government assures that 
that irrespective of what happens i am the buyer i am going to take it or create some market elsewhere so what this is the supply side now the other side there are again two things that the government will need to do one is incentivize affordable vaccine manufacturing and i hear i am not talking about r&d i am actually talking about hardcore manufacturing and taking it off unless you do that the industry is not going to react only because you know it has to or there are some other factors government is a major major player in this so that incentivization has to come and the second is and let me say this very clearly much of the r&d much of the clinical trials not happening in india is because we have a very very complicated regime of clearance one of the most amazing things about india over the last 75 years is the divergence from many similar countries which got independence at about the same time we invested in research and higher education in a manner which was in many people criticized as being too luxurious for a country like ours space atomic energy defense and in fundamental research on scale the result of that is we have in my uh, view a salt and pepper situation where the pepper are is our top institutions all over the country the laboratories of the indian council for medical research the uh, defense labs the dst labs the department of biotechnology labs the csir labs are spread all over the country and extraordinary capabilities in these areas put together now the rest of the country next to this pepper is salt, is the salt of the country and we need to have a way by which the pepper connects with the salt as as simple as that and therefore these laboratories which have done fantastic work over the years need to address problems which are derived from the ecosystem and that's feasible so this is the challenge you have about vaccine development and technology and new drugs and so on and so forth is an enormous challenge for any country and for a country the size of india it would seem an impossible challenge but given our capabilities it is just communication ease of communication ease of collaboration making rationalizing our regulation even better can be transformative in a shorter period than ever before so the daring is there in our industry the loosening up of connection between industry and ac academia is feasible that can be done on scale typically that happens when there's a crisis we must learn it happened during the covid crisis people collaborated a lot more we need to now collaborate when there isn't a crisis we shouldn't just be good at resolving crises and creating crises but now our principal goal should be preventing crises from happening and that we have the ability to do